Today I'm going to preach the last in the Season of Light series. And I know for many, it's a long ramp up to Christmas. And then come December 26th, like, all right, let's move on to something new. Anybody in that camp, you're like, all right, we've been there, done that, let's move on. Well, this is not a Christmas message, but it is a message about the light that came on that Christmas morning. So I'm putting it in this series. I'm going to read 11 verses today, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, reading today from the ESV. I'll explain that later in the message, why I chose that version today. But in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So for just the next 20 plus minutes here today, I want to preach on the overcoming light the overcoming light. God bless you. You may be seated. The Gospel of John is written specifically. John would write this in his final chapter where he would talk about the ministry of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus and all that Jesus did. And he would say that at the end of that, that if everything was written down, that Jesus had done, he said, I suppose that all the books of the world would not be able to contain them because of all that he did. But he says this following that statement that I wrote this, though, that you may believe that he is the Son of God. That Son of God, understanding that the Son of God is God himself in human flesh, the deity that is God is robed in this human flesh. And so he gives this purpose at the end of the gospel, and it's kind of the the whole setup of what he does and all that he writes, starting with the first three verses of his gospel. The prologue of John when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That he explains that he was in the beginning. The Word, Word is a Greek word, it's logos, and it means this, the revelation and plan, something that you intentionally thought of and that you planned, and what he says is God is in essence what he thinks and what he has thought and what he has planned came to be that Christmas morning when Jesus was born. It is a callback, and you've heard me use that phrase, callback, a few times over the last few weeks. It is a callback to the first book of the Bible. In fact, that callback, not just to the first book of the Bible, but for the first chapter of the Bible. For it too starts with that same phrase, in the beginning. Except it says this, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. We see this same tie-in, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It sounds a whole lot like in the beginning God. 
He does this. It's there in the beginning. And what God does in Genesis, He doesn't explain His origin. He doesn't explain where He came from. He just explains everything else that emanated from Him. That in the beginning, God already was. Once again, that can blow your mind if you think about how does something not have a beginning because everything we know in this life has a beginning, it has an end, it can't always exist, it doesn't fit our understanding of time, but once again, God is not in time, time is in Him, He is outside of that, He is this other dimension, He is beyond time, and so before time began, God was, just in the beginning, God, and He speaks into time, and he says, let there be light. The light doesn't have a description. It doesn't have an origin other than God just spoke it into being. Think about a source of light that doesn't have a source. It's just there. An unfathomable thing, but God just speaks, and he says, let there be light. His spoken word is the source of that light. The light, the Bible says, he would call day, and the darkness he called night. And it wasn't that night was the presence of darkness, but it was the absence of light. That the absence of light is darkness. Darkness does not overcome the light, but light overcomes the darkness. And God would say when He creates this light that He it is basically He Himself is that light. We see this in Revelation when He talks about that new Jerusalem where it says there's no need of a sun or moon or stars because the Lamb will be the light. That the light will just emanate from the One who sits on the throne. But God doesn't stop with just speaking light into existence. He goes on to create the sun, the moon, the stars, he creates physical, tangible, visible sources of light. Something that he would say would rule and mark the signs and seasons and days and years. That's why we have calendars, because there is a, a system to what God is doing. There is a fixed process. We're in the wintertime. Why is that? Because it's the process of Orbit, orbit the, the moon and the sun and earth, all of those working together, orbiting around, everything orbiting around the, the sun, the tilt of the earth's axis. But this sun, he said, would rule the day, the moon would rule the night. This sun would give light to all. This sun would enable us to have life. Scientists have long understood the distance of our earth to the sun. I, I don't know fully how they would figure all of that out. I'm not sure exactly how they can measure that, but they've come up with a measurement that is 93 million miles. In case you're wondering, that's a long way. But what they've discovered in that distance from the sun to the earth is that it is in the exact perfect location for there to be life. Too close to the sun, the temperature is too hot. Nothing can live. No water can be there. It, it would evaporate if it was there, but it can't be there. It's too close. The heat is too great. Too far away from the sun, and it's a cold and frozen planet where nothing can live. But it just so happens in the universe that God speaks into existence that everything is perfectly aligned and there's one planet where people can be. And it is there that He puts and creates man. Scientists, it's, they do amazing things, but sometimes humorous things. They've determined that the earth has about a, or the sun, rather, has about a nine billion year life cycle. I'm not sure how they can figure out how long the sun is going to be there. 
we're roughly 4.6 billion years, according to scientists, into that life cycle. Nobody's been around to see it. I'm not really sure how they just fathom that. They make a lot of assumptions that whatever rate there may be helium being burned up, that it's the same rate all the time. I don't know, but what they're saying is the sun will basically implode in another 4.4 billion years. But long before that happens, a billion years from now, we will all have burned up because it will be too bright then and we will have all died. And Mars will be the perfect planet in our universe. I don't believe any of that. I don't believe they can factor any of that out. I think all they're doing is looking at a little bit of data, coming up with some conclusions that will support their idea that there is no God. What I would tell you, though, that the God who spoke all of that into existence, that that sun he created then and that light that he created then brought physical life and enabled physical life for all of us. But what John would do, he's not talking about physical life. He's not talking about the physical sun in our universe. But in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. All things that were made were made through Him. And in Him was life. And the life was the light of men. That this sun he speaks of in John chapter 1 is a spiritual life-giving force. A spiritual light that shines into the darkness. Verse 4, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. He was the source and the giver of life. And that life was what would show humanity the way to get in relationship again and restore relationship with God. Verse 5, and I'm going to walk through this, this passage for a minute or two. The light could not overcome the darkness. The darkness, it is that sinful Humanity stumbling blindly in the dark. I'll address this more in a few minutes. But it jumps in verse 6 to John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John who also had a supernatural birth. John who was prophesied by the angel. John who was prophesied actually in the Old Testament that would be the forerunner of of one that would make way in the wilderness for the Messiah. This John came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Verse 7. But John the Baptist, which is the passage, is speaking of John the Revelator who's writing this, would make sure and tell us in verse 8 that John the Baptist was not the light. He just came to bear witness about the light. He came just to tell that the light was coming, and then he was saying the light is actually here. We see that in John chapter 2, when the light acts, or John chapter 1, actually later in the chapter, where he would say, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, and, and that he would baptize Jesus, and when he does, that there would be a voice from heaven that John would hear, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He was a man sent from God. His birth, his ministry, all pointing to the light. And John would write that the true light which gives light to everyone was still coming into the world. But as we read in verses 10 and 11, this world that he created, they rejected him. They didn't recognize him. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Can't imagine. God knows all things. He knew what was coming. He knew why he was here. He knew there was going to be a crucifixion. But this rejection... In fact, the text would specifically point out that he came to his own, the Jewish people who had been praying for his arrival. They had been looking forward to his arrival, yet when he came, they rejected him and they crucified him. But there was hope yet because John would say, but to all who did receive him, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. Those who received him received a new birth, which was from above. This new birth that John would delineate in chapter 3 as he tells the story of Jesus interacting with Nicodemus. You must be born again to enter or see the kingdom of God. How do you do that? You're born of water and of spirit. This new birth experience, it is not of blood, it's not human origin, it's not human desire, but it is being born of God. The end of the text that I would read, verse 14, then describes that light who was coming, and the Word was made flesh. He dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. The glory is of the only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This plan and purpose of God, the Word that was God, became flesh came into the world. You see the phrase there, dwelt among us. And you may remember I've said it before, but it has the same connotation as the Old Testament tabernacle in the wilderness where it really says He tabernacled among us. The tabernacle, that symbol, that place of God's presence, that place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept in the Holy of Holies where the presence of God always was, Jesus tabernacled among us, the visible manifestation of the glory of God in a form that could be observed without death. Moses, the friend of God, if you remember the Old Testament story, Moses on the mountain, and he says to God, let me see your glory. And God's response is him, you can't, nobody can see my glory and live. That if I showed you my glory, it would kill you. So he hid Moses in a little cleft of the rock. and Just showed him a little glimpse of it. And when Moses would come down off the mountain after seeing just that little glimpse of the glory of God. His face shone. With brightness and light. The people were afraid, so we can't even look at that. You need to cover your face. We, we, don't, we can't. We're scared of the glory that we see. Just a little touch, yet Jesus would come full of grace and truth, that visible representation of the glory of God, the light of God in human form. He uses full, abounding, or complete all of the grace that's needed and all the truth that's needed the grace of God, Paul would write, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching them to deny unworldliness and godly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And Jesus would say of the Word, thy Word is truth, and then He Himself would say, I am the truth. Not just representing the truth, but He Himself was that truth. And that Word or that truth became flesh, and we call that coming Christmas. But it's more than a story. It's more than a once a year celebration. It's more than just a nativity scene. But it is the manifestation of light into a dark and sinful world. To a dark and sinful humanity. A light that shows the way to God. A light that shows us how to be saved. A Light that shows us how to live. A light that reveals God's glory. Anybody thankful if you've seen the light? The old song, the old hymn, I saw the light. I saw the light no more in darkness, no more at night. That when you come into a relationship with Jesus, the darkness is dispelled because the light overcomes the darkness. The darkness does not overcome the light. So, why tell you all of this? Most of which you already knew. And 
But let me go back to verse 5. The darkness could not overcome the light. If the ESV would say it this way, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What does that mean? They rejected Him. They crucified Him. Hell tried to destroy Him. But John would write, the light was not overcome by the darkness. The darkness could not overcome it. The darkness didn't have the power to quench the light. The darkness didn't have the ability to stop the light. The darkness didn't have the ability to put it out or extinguish the light. And John is writing after the fact and saying the light is still shining in the darkness when he writes this in the, in the 90s, some 60 years after Jesus' ascension. He says the light is still shining and the light is still there. The darkness has not overcome it. It is still shining the glory of God. That the darkness could not overcome the light then. The first century, the darkness could not overcome it. The darkness can also not overcome the light now. He is still the light of the world. That on December 31st, 2023, the light is still shining and He is still the light of the world. You may say, surely, He's going to be overcome by the darkness Everything has a lifespan. The sun, we've only got 4.4 billion years left. I'm not too worried about that. But the sun is just a big star. Anybody ever seen a falling star? It's like our sun, except it burned out. You see it shooting through the sky. And it happened a long time ago, because they're a long ways away. And even though the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, that's still a long ways away. When you see that star, you're not really seeing that. You're seeing what happened a long time back. But if other stars have a lifespan, surely our sun will have a lifespan. And everything in life that puts out light, it has a lifespan. Have you ever bought light bulbs that are supposed to last 10 years and last about three weeks? There's a lemon in the bunch. I get it every time. In our bathroom, it home, the master bath, I'm sorry, the political correct word, the main bath, just, just kidding, the master bath, I've changed light bulbs, there's all these different sockets, I've, I, something's always out, three and four year lights, oh, it's never going to burn out, they burn out. Two lights on the same vehicle at the same time burned out. Surely, his light will be extinguished at some point. Surely, he can't always burn. He can't always shine. But I would tell you, he will never burn out. That Jesus will never, the light will never stop shining. The glory of God will never stop uh, emanating from him. His light will continue to shine. The darkness could not overcome it then, and the darkness cannot overcome it now. And the darkness will not overcome it in the future. And this is where I was going, and all of what I've said is coming to this point. Just like the darkness cannot overcome His light, the darkness cannot overcome you if you are walking in the light. That if you are in the light, the darkness has no hope of putting out the light. The future is bright if you're in His light. But the future is bleak if 
you're not in the light. So how do we walk in the light? got to choose to follow Jesus. And you got to stick with Jesus. If you're going to walk in the light, you actually have to come to the light. And then when you get in the light, you have to stay in the light. It sounds pretty simple. It sounds pretty logical. Sometimes more difficult to do. But God has used light throughout the Scripture in fact, I've alluded to it in this series, the cloud by day and the fire by night, the fire that would illuminate the camp, the fire that would illuminate their path and would tell them where to go. When the sun was down and they couldn't see the cloud anymore, they would have a pillar, of, as the King James would say, a pillar of fire that would guide them and give light to the camp. I was reminded of theaters in Branson, and I've been to other places and concerts and different things, but most recently the Sight and Sound Theater in Branson. And when the lights are out and the show is going on, and you're needing to get to your seat, the ushers have a flashlight. They don't shine it in your face because they're not trying to see you. They don't even shine it to where your seat is. Be like, over there somewhere. Go, good luck. No, what they do is they shine it on the floor. So you can see where you're going. You can see where you're walking. And as long as you stick with the light, you're not going to stumble. You're not going to fall. You're not going to trip. You're not going to land in somebody's lap. And they're going to take you and what they're doing and not just looking at the floor just to be looking at the floor, but they're looking at the numbers that tells them the rows. And so they know exactly where you're going. They get to your row and they're like, right here. Your seat's just over there. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. His word is what guides us his word is what tells us where to go. His word is what we're to follow. That if we're going to stay in the light, we have to stay in His word. And sticking with the word is sticking with Jesus. The sticking with the truth of the word of God is sticking with Him. Just this morning, I was up before it was light. Outside, and I mentioned before, I like me a good night light because you can't see in the dark. At least I can't. Up until about three weeks ago, we always had a, light, a night light in that master bathroom that would give enough light if you go in there and it would shine a little bit out so you didn't hit stuff on the way to the bathroom. Not that I need to talk about bathroom, but ever, you know, I, I don't sleep for eight hours in a, uh, straight. I'm getting up at some point. <laughs> I'm 51. By the time I'm 61, I may be up five times. I don't know. Somebody's feeling that. Got an amen over there. This morning, I get up. Actually, to take my shower, still, still dark out. Blinds are closed. There may be a little light from street lights, but not enough to see much. Take a shower. Turn off. Well, we have these double doors that are at the entrance to our bathroom. and So when I get up and my wife's sleeping, I'll close those doors and, you know, not making a lot of noise. Took my shower. Get out of the shower to go down to... The hallway, and I turned off the light because if I'm going to open the doors, I don't want the light spilling out. It's a long runway to really. 
And I'm reaching for the double doors, and I'm trying to be so quiet, but I just turned off a light, and now my eyes are not adjusted, and I'm reaching for it as I'm reaching, and I run in, I hit the door. And I open the door, and it's still dark, and I'm stumbling through the room, and I'm walking toward the hall, and there's no lights out. In the, there's, you'd think we love darkness. Feeling for the door to make sure. When there is no light, it's easy to stumble. When there is no light, it's hard to find your way. And when there is no light, things are dangerous. But He is the overcoming light. And if we walk with Him and we stay in the light, then we are overcoming with Him. So there are some decisions for us today as Anna comes. We have a few decisions. Most of you, and maybe all of you, have already made the right decision on a number of these. But just like that first century that John was writing of, people still have a choice today when it comes to the light. Are you going to reject the light or are you going to receive the light? And I would tell you, like just as it is in the natural, it's a whole lot better when there's light. There's a whole lot less danger when there's light. So it's really not a hard choice to make. Light or darkness. Reject the one who came and died in my place and paid the penalty for my sin or just receive him and go, I'm going to follow you today. But as you hear me say so often, way too many people will start out with Jesus. It's somewhere along the way they wander away from the light. There's a number of reasons why, but but think back to that theater usher who's showing you where to go. Instead of watching the light, you start looking around and you end up in a different row, in a different aisle because you took your eyes off the light got to follow the light. And sometimes in life, what we do is say, this is where I'm going. We want the light to follow us. But just like the children of Israel, they decided they wanted to go east on a certain day. The light wasn't following them. The light's heading west. But the cloud of by day, it's, it's heading the other direction. You can go east if you want. But when it gets dark, there's going to be no pillar of fire. There's going to be no light. We do that with Jesus and our walk with Him. We're like, Jesus, this is what I'm doing. Come with me. And what Jesus says, this is where I'm going. You come with me. The disciples didn't say to Jesus, follow me, but he said to them, you follow me. So we have a decision to stick with the light or go our own way. We have another decision that, to make, and we see it earlier in that passage where John came to testify of the light. He was not the light. We can testify, we can hide the light. We can testify about what he's done, and we can testify about his goodness. And it's really, we call that evangelism, of sharing the light with somebody else. And think about it in terms, and, and we've not really ever done a candlelight service. But at Christmas time, it's 
traditional to do a candlelight service. Where you start with one light, and the person next to you, they have a candle, and you light their candle. And now then they light somebody else's candle. Until you have a room filled with light. That is the plan of God. To testify of the light so that other people would be bearers of this light. I'm looking forward to a glorious future. That in a world going crazy, if you stand together with me, in a world that is not like the one I started in, some 51 plus years ago that no matter what's going on in the world around us no matter how dark the night the light will still burn bright that there is no fear of the darkness when you walk in the light so the question for you today the biggest one is this are you just are you going to stick with the light today And I believe the answer is yes. I feel the presence of God and the feedback. I see the expressions on the faces. When we stick with Him, fear is not our future. Heartbreak is not our future. Sickness is not our future. Death is not our future, but He is you're going to live a life that's overcoming and to live a life in the light, would you just come around the front for a few minutes and would you celebrate what God has done in your life and would you celebrate His goodness, would you celebrate His salvation, would you celebrate His light, would you celebrate His glory. God, we thank You today. We give You praise today because of what You've done in our lives. We give You praise today for what You've done, Jesus. We glorify You, Jesus. Fear is not my future, but you are.